I want to thank Don also for praying for us. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. We're, we're going to go into a message now that uh, I believe the Lord would have us to understand. Okay, so today the message is actually called, um, it's, it's a mixture of words. I'm going to talk about totalitarianism and authoritarianism. The reason being is they're kind of the same process. They're kind of the same thought. Um, authoritarianism, if you look in Apple's dictionary, which I've done here, you can see that it's the enforcement or advocacy of strict obedience to authority. And it's demonstrated by the people, right? So like, for example, if the, those in charge say put on a mask and everybody puts on a mask, that's a, an example of authoritarianism, okay? So we follow because they said, like, that's just what we do. And so we're actually giving into the ideology of authoritarianism just by doing something like that. And some of it makes a lot of good sense. Of course, some would argue that does, but I'm going to say something else like at a, at a red stoplight, you stop your car. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's also giving into authoritarianism because who told you to do that? The state, right? The nation, the government that you're living in. So some of it makes sense. Some of it can be a little bit far reaching. So this idea of authoritarianism, the enforcement or advocacy of strict obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom. That's the, that's the actual definition of that word, authoritarianism. So when we give up our rights, our personal choices, our freedoms, we're giving into what's known by definition as authoritarianism. Now, there's another one that is called totalitarianism. Here's another definition of something else, which is just as big and ugly, except authoritarianism generally starts and totalitarianism takes over. Okay. Did you follow that? Authoritarianism generally starts a process that later ends up in what's called totalitarianism. And so totalitarianism, it's a system of government that is centralized and dictatorial and requires complete subservience to the state or government, right? So now that is many times it is run by the, uh, a person, whether it be a very popular, maybe good looking or authoritative, charismatic person or group of people. One very good example of totalitarianism that came as a result of authoritarianism is the rule of Hitler. Okay, that is totalitarianism. He was a very charismatic person that had a lot of courage, like for example, I watched a dic uh, documentary on him and his life and some of what was going on during the, um, the war there. And in his vehicle that he would drive in or be driven in, because he wouldn't drive, of course, he would be driven, right? Because of his status, he needed somebody to take care of him. He wouldn't sit in his vehicle. He would stand. He would, you've seen a lot of pictures of him driving or being driven and he's standing. Well, that was immediately a very, very looming case of courage on his behalf. Because, I mean, any time at any place he could have been shot and killed, mm. right? Well, his reasoning was, I could be shot and killed anywhere at any place. I'd rather do it standing than sitting. Oh. And so his persona was so powerful, even in that decision, I'm going to stand instead of sit where everybody can know me and I'm an open target because he knew he was anyways. Mm. That was so powerful that he actually captured the attention of many, many people. You know that, you know the history, right? And so that was totalitarianism, okay? Now let's go into our Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter six. This is a very, very popular story. You've heard it as a kid and we've heard it many times in prophetic scenarios as we've gone through our Bibles in the many years we've been Christians. But this time we're going to look at it through the eyes of totalitarianism and authoritarianism. Okay. Notice what happens in Daniel chapter six. It pleased Darius. Now who was Darius? He was the leader. He was the head. He was the ruler of the government. 
It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes. So he had a group of leaders. He had a, an agency, if you will. So Darius set up 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. You see, Darius had a kingdom and he had leaders in that kingdom. Well, then what happens is in verse 2, over these, which was the 120 princes, he had three presidents of whom Daniel was first. So even in the presidency, he had a leadership organization. There, were, there was Daniel, and then there was two presidents, and then there was the 120 princes. Okay, so the king, Daniel, two presidents, and 120 princes. You got that in your head? And it says, verse 2 in the middle, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. So if there's any problems in the government, then people will go to the setup establishment, okay? And everybody will have to go through them, if you will, to get to Darius and his ear. Because Darius is way too busy as the king. He doesn't have time for every single situation to be brought to his table. He's already got enough paper on his desk. And so he's set up a system to where if you got problems, talk to the 120. If they can't figure it out, they're going to talk to the two. And the two and the, the one, which is the, the presidents or the, um, yeah, presidents and, and Daniel, the other president, if they can't figure it out, then I want to hear it and we'll talk all together. And you know how it went. Even with Moses, his father-in-law Jethro had told him that, you know, listen, you can't answer every question. You've got to have systems set up. And so there was rulers over thousands, rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, rulers over tens. And it's like, yes, that's way better because if somebody's got a problem, they can talk to this guy. And if they can't figure it out, they'll talk to those people and then those people and those people. And then finally it'll come to me and I'll be like, uh, that's pretty simple. Just do this. And everybody's like, oh, wow. Okay. Kind of like Solomon cutting the baby in half, right? Same thing. And so you have here a system that looks kind of suspicious to me. It looks a little bit like God the Father has a son in this case named Daniel, God the Father would be Darius. So God the Father has a son, and there's two cherubim that would be the other two prince, uh, presidents, and then under them is the 120, right? So you have the father and his son, and then the two cherubim, which would represent the entire ministry of the angelic host, and then the 120 would be like those down on the earth that, that, that are kind of working with God in his kingdom. And so, this system seems very suspicious as one that has been set up to mimic or personate the true government of God, right? You can see that same thing in uh, Revelation chapter 17 with the kingdom of Babylon and Revelation 21 with the kingdom of Jerusalem. You have the great city, which is God's holy city, and you have the great city, which is the devil's city. And they look so similar. Why? Because the devil wants to set up exactly what God has so as to deceive you and me, right? That's what's happening here in this government system. It's kind of like the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Rome and papal Rome and America and the Protestants therein, they're doing everything they can to set up a system that looks just like God's system so as to deceive the whole world. Same thing's happening, right? So it's very interesting to me that we have this scenario. Now, to explain a little bit what happens in this chapter, we will not go into every detail because this really gets deep. There is so much in here. In fact, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Daniel chapter six. And you'll see a little bit of why uh, after the time we have together. But what's happening is, this chapter is chapter 6. You know, chronologically, 6 comes before 8, right? I mean, you know that, don't you? But in this book, 8 comes before 6. Did you know that? You didn't know that, did you? Okay, watch this. Go to chapter 8, verse 1. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of who? Belshazzar, right? So who is he a ruler of? Babylon. Babylon. Or what is he a ruler of? He's the ruler of Babylon. Belshazzar is a ruler of Babylon. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, 
go back to Daniel chapter 6 and notice it says, it pleased Darius. Wait a minute. Who did Darius rule over? Babylonians? The Medes, right? So we have here that chapter 6 is actually after chapter 8. That's really important to understand because in chapter 8, Daniel, given interestingly the same way that John was given a, his gospel, was by God the Father who gave it to Jesus Christ, who gave it to an angel, who gave it to John to give to us. You can read that in Revelation 1 verse 1. In the same way, God the Father gave the message to Jesus, who gave it to Gabriel, who gave it to Daniel. That's what happened in Daniel chapter 8. You can just see that because you know what happened in Revelation 1. And also what happens in Zechariah and with Moses and all these other situations. So, what you have here is Daniel receives this message in chapter 8 that talks about there's a ram and a goat, and then there's the four horns and there's this little horn, right? And this little horn he doesn't know about because he was told that the ram was the Medes and the Persians and the he goat was Greece, right? Uh, did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You can read it in any ways in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. If I got it wrong, you can read it there and that's what's correct. Anyways, that was explained. There's the Medes and the Persians and there's Greece. But then there's this little king that comes up and he rules and he's got dark sentences and he's, he uses uh, witchcraft and, and um, deception to take those into his government. And Daniel's scratching his head like, I don't get it. I don't understand this part. He said it was the Medes and the Persians. He said it was Greece. And then this other king? Yeah, yeah, he's going to rule for 2,300 days. And, whoa! He passed out because he was overwhelmed with this ideology of God's people being so overcome for 2,300 years. Daniel understood that it was for the end of time, and that's what he had explained. Actually, Gabriel explained that to him in previous verses in Daniel chapter 8. So, what happens is that Daniel doesn't get this little horn scenario that was described to him in chapter 8. He doesn't understand. And so he's praying, God, please help me. And so at the beginning of the rule of Darius, in the third year, right? Isn't that what it says? No, 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 sorry, that was, that was the other one. In, this is probably the first year of Darius because he had just overtaken um, the me, uh, Babylonians in chapter five. And that's why where it fits in is to show what Darius did as a Median taken over Babylon, okay? So that's where the stories are put together and then the prophecies are put together in the book of Daniel. That's why six comes after eight is because it's more of a story rather than a prophecy, but history repeats itself no matter what anybody tells you. And so this history is going to repeat. Now that we have all this background set up with Daniel chapter eight, not understanding that little horn and praying, God, please help me understand, God gave Daniel a physical, actual, governmental, hands-on, first-hand account experience of what Daniel chapter 8 was foretelling. You see, because this little horn would end up ruling for what we call the abomination of desolation. Okay, This time period where the enemy has full sway as an authoritarian and as also as a totalitarian government ruling system, you see? And so you have like one man at the head during the dark ages, and that one man, no matter what he says, goes, and that one man wants to drill in and take away your rights, your personal um, freedoms, and so that you can't read what you wanna read, you can't hear what you wanna hear, you can't go where you wanna go, you need to follow the dictates of Rome. Are okay, you with me? That's what happened in the Dark Ages. The, the Middle Ages as well, if you want to call it that. And so Daniel didn't understand that. But so what God did is God gave Daniel a first-hand experience in chapter 6 of what chapter 8 was foretelling. So that we would be able to know that God gave an answer to Daniel and his conundrum about this little horn not being able to understand what it was all about. So that we can see into the future with this story of Daniel chapter 6. Now let's read more. It says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. We already have the false system with the Father, the Son, the angels, and the ministers here on the earth. 
set up with Darius, Daniel, the two princes, and the presidents. Or, sorry, the presidents and the princes. I got that one mixed up. But there it says in verse 3, This Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over all the whole realm. Now, didn't that happen with God setting Christ over the whole realm? And somebody was jealous because of that, right? You see how that whole scenario works out? You've got the whole thing playing out. This is the entire controversy in these three verses of what happened with the fall of Lucifer, who is now Satan. Okay, he was jealous because this excellent spirit was found in this second in command, if you will, Daniel. Well, it says, verse 4, Then the presidents not Daniel, but the other two, then those two presidents and princes, the 120 of them, they sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. So first they were trying to find some occasion against Daniel in the kingdom business. So what did they do? They went through his emails. They went through his texts. They went through his messenger history, his online internet search history on his laptop, his phone, and his desktop computer. They were looking through everything he did. Did he pay taxes? Was he honest in what he promised? Did he follow up all the promises in his emails? And what about his checklists? Did he do those things correctly and on time? And they couldn't find a single fault with Daniel. This guy was stellar, right? It says there, I was going to say sterling as well. Stellar or sterling. Good both good words. So it says there in verse 4 in the middle, but they could find none occasion nor fault because for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. That's what God has called us to be like at this time in earth's history. When there's a false system that's set up and your personal rights are being taken away, when there are these authoritarian muscles being flexed and you're feeling like, you know what, I'm, I can foresee because I'm logical and I can understand prophecy. I can foresee that all of my personal desires are going to be swept out from underneath my feet. I'm seeing authoritarian government starting to establish. I'm seeing totalitarian control or hints coming around, right? So we're, we're starting to see these things like, some of the governors of our nation here in America have made the craziest decisions and have tried to flex their totalitarian muscles way beyond what they should. We're starting to see this happen all over us. I mean, if I opened up the floor and just said, what do you guys think? Are there any examples? I, could, I bet you you could come up with probably 10 within a minute, right? Some of some of the things we've been hearing about of you must do this, you must do that. You can't go out past this. You have to be at your work or you only... People can go to work that, or you have to, we're going to, there's going to be a vaccine for, you know what I'm saying? Like all these things are starting to pop up all over the place. Why? And then they went out and did it. And they're doing it. And so this is authoritarian. This is totalitarian. Okay. That, those are the, the, the hints that are coming around. Okay. Now we're going to see here in verse five. Then said these men, which are these men? It's the two presidents and the 120 princes. Okay, 123, two of them. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. We've already sought the kingdom works of him. Except we find it against him concerning his religion. The law of his God. Is he faithful to God in every way? Because, I mean, he's been faithful in the kingdom. We can't find any faults with him. But what about his tithe? What about his Sabbath keeping? What about his being honest? We can check all his emails to see if he promised something and he was lying. What about all this stuff in his religion? What about the law of his God? Is he, fo is he actually taking the name of his God in vain? Can we prove it? Is he claiming to be a Christian but really isn't? Does he believe a different God than what the Bible describes? You see, all these things are going to be brought up and when we're brought before judges and counselors and kings, these are the things that they're going to be asking. Can he really substantiate his belief from the Bible and the Bible alone? If not, he is a farce. He's just claiming to be a Christian. You see, that's why it's so important that we know the Bible. We know it for ourselves because we're going to have to wield it 
in front of counselors and kings and judges as though we are the only one on the earth that holds this belief with the Bible as our foundation. Okay, we're, we're in serious times. And Daniel was tested this way. You can see it right here in verse 6. Then these presidents and princes, which was the 122, they assembled together to the king. And now there's a council of peace, if you will. They've come together and they said to the king, O King Darius, live forever. I love to say this. Live forever is actually a false gospel. But what's interesting is it's the identical words of a true gospel. You see, Daniel later said, King Darius, live forever. That was the true gospel because of what Daniel meant, right? But these folk, they're saying, King Darius, live forever because we want to continue receiving the paycheck that you've offered us because it's kind of good. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're servants of the king here. I mean, we're getting paid and we're going to eat all this stuff. And, all, you know, wow, we get to live here. We get to serve in these courts. That's what they're wishing for. But Daniel was saying, no, King Darius, live eternally because of God sending his son and offering you eternal life through submission to his will. That's the gospel that Daniel was preaching. Not this false gospel like we just want to keep our job. Keep living. We like how it's going. So in today's world, we kind of have the same thing going on. I can say God. I can say Father. I can say Spirit. I can say Son. I can say all these wonderful things. Grace, faith, hope, love, charity. But I might be saying an entirely false gospel. I'm using the right words, but it's wrong, you see. And so we must be able to substantiate the true gospel, even using the same words, from the Bible and the Bible alone, because we will be challenged on it. We're going to have offenders that are saying, or people that are, how would you say, um, against us, that are using the same identical words. No, 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 that's not true because God the Father and the Son and the Spirit and the angels and all this stuff and grace and faith. So what you're saying is not true. You're like, no, but God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and angels and, and grace and faith, that's what's true. And they're like, no, it's not. You see, so it's going to be a war that is so very razor sharp with our understanding that we're going to have to know. We're going to have to be solid. And I think Daniel was. But it's saying in verse 6 again, these presidents and princes, they assembled together to the king and said, King, false gospel, live forever. Verse 7, all the presidents, they said, of the kingdom and the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together. Was that true? All the presidents? It's not true. See, they're, they're coming together in what's called a false unity. This is like an ecumenical movement based on not what's true. Okay. They're all coming together. They all want to uh, get the ear of the king, the one leader at the head of this system, but they're not doing it in truth. And so what's happening is they're setting up a false system, a false gospel, okay? a false government. So it says there in verse 7, again, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains, we have consulted together to establish a royal statute. In order to be royal, there must be a king. So at the end of time, will there be a king? Oh yeah, the Pope is a king. Did you know that? He is a king. He is also the president because he has a uh, rulership, a, a kingdom. In fact, it's the smallest kingdom in the United Nations. They are the smallest kingdom which is both a church and a government. And so they're a little bit different than everybody else. And they're the smallest. So it's kind of like the same thing happening again as what occurred in the Dark Ages. They're the smallest and they're a little bit different. They're church and state together. So when it says we want to establish a royal statute, you must have a king in order to get a royal statute, right? And then it says, and to make a firm decree. Well, why a firm decree? Well, because you need a very large military to back up the royal statute that you've established. I see you need a large military base to make it a firm decree, something that's not weak, but firm. And so you have this royal and civil scenario coming together in this verse. But it's, it's all under a false premise because not all the presidents were involved. And so you have lies that are the foundation of this false system. And then it says in verse 8. Oh, sorry, we're in the middle of verse 7. 
The captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that, here's what it is, that whosoever, now who does that not include? Nobody. 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 Good answer. Yes, you, good answer. I thought you guys were going to say, well, this person. No, it means nobody. It, who does that not include? Nobody. That includes everybody. Whosoever is a worldwide movement. Okay, it's a false system based on what looks like the true government of God, but it's not. And they are establishing their foundations upon lies. Okay, they need royalty and they need firm decrees. So there's royalty, there's civil, military, there's falsehood, there's unity, there's the meetings with the king, and it says whosoever. That means everybody's involved. That whosoever shall ask a petition of any god. What is a petition to a god? What do we call that? Prayer. Prayer. So wait a minute. I thought you needed royal and civil laws. Here you're talking about all this and you're coming together to a king, but now you're talking about prayer? So now we have church and state combining, don't we? So it says, we have said that we need you to make a royal statute and a firm decree that whosoever will pray to any god, or man for that matter, for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now why 30 days? Well, because the final movements will be rapid, rapid ones. 30 days is not a long time. And this story illustrates a very short time where all of this occurs, right? The last movements will be rapid ones. And so when it says here that we have asked everybody to pray, um, th anybody that does pray, that they need to pray to you instead of to any God or man. You are the focus. So now the totalitarian focus comes in. We need one man at the head, a very charismatic person that will be able to influence the, the whole world with these authoritarian ideologies that we have. We're saying everybody's involved, but it's not really true. You see, we, we want to show ourselves as though everybody's unified. Well, what's one of the ways we can do that? Well, just take some voices off of YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and some faces off of Parler and, and in fact, just wipe Parler completely out, right? And so let's do that so that everybody sounds like we're saying the same thing. And then we're all together. All the princes and presidents, the governments, the civil authorities, the rulers, the judges, the counselors, the captains, the sheriffs, we've all come together and we've got something to present to you, O king. The king's like, wow, this is amazing. We've got unity all over the world, though. whosoever, everywhere. This is great. He's going to be excited, right? The king is actually going to believe this because look at all the evidence. And so it says there in the end of verse 7, if they don't pray to you, O king, they're going to be killed. We're going to call for persecution unto death. They will be thrown or cast into the den of lions. Well, there is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can understand he's the one that's trying to get those people that are not following suit with his false government of himself being Darius, him having a son, which is the beast in his image, you know, because there's the father in his image, the God that has a son, and there's the beast in his image. So you have Darius and Daniel, and you have the two cherubim and the 120. You have all that going on with the presidents and the princes. And this, this, this false government that the king has set up and these people are using it. They're using it against this king who doesn't really understand what's really going on. And so it says there in verse 8, Now, O king, you know, the one that's going to be prayed to, we want you to establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of Medes and Persians, which does not alter. <laughs> well, you know what that is, right? If you write a law, and you claim that that law cannot be changed because that law is perfect, what are you claiming? Infallibility. Infallibility. That's exactly the definition of the Catholic online uh, dictionary mm -hmm. defining infallibility. Mm -hmm. When they write laws, they are so good they don't need to be changed. <laughs> right here you see it. Mm -hmm. You know, the Medes and the Persians, we write a law, and you can't change one of those laws. Mm -hmm. but, so we want you to write your name on this law that everybody it becomes under the leadership, rulership, dicta dictatorship of a totalitarian system. 
Uh, yeah, religion's involved, but really it's the civil government that's bringing all of this to pass, right? And once one of the ways that it's happening today, pharmakia. Anybody heard that word before? I'll tell you, it's insane. COVID-1984. So I could go on and we can explain all the details. I've done this message before. I've talked about it. And if you want to hear it in, in greater detail, I can give you a link. Just ask me through the uh, comments or revelationwithdaniel.com slash contact. I'd be able to share that, that message in fuller detail. But the whole point here is that Daniel, in the midst of this totalitarian system that was on the foundation of lies that affected the entire world, that claimed unity, but they didn't really have it. They included these laws that were, for one, void of religious liberty. They've taken your rights away. They've forced upon you their ideologies, their desires, which is totalitarianism. And they have said that if you don't follow the dictates of our conscience, you will fall under the guillotine, as we had read before in the French Revolution. Now, I want to go back in for a second in our minds to the French Revolution. I did an interview with a professor from La Sierra University in Southern California not long ago. The title was Ellen White, George Floyd, and the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen that video, you might be interested because there's a real connection there with what's happening today and the French Revolution. And so you can go and find that by um, looking it up on the YouTube page or ask me and I can send you a link. There's a book that if you haven't read, you really should read. This is a book that goes over Christian history in a way that no other book can. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It, it, bar none, it blows the top. It's called The Great Controversy. This book is really powerful. And in a chapter called The French Revolution, Okay, the Bible and the French Revolution. I think it's chapter 15 if you're interested. It says, With the flight of the Huguenots, which is the faithful people that were keeping the commandments of God, living in the mountains because of persecution. They lived in the mountains because they were persecuted there in Rome. Well, after the flight of the Huguenots, so that's what's happening. They've already left. With the flight of the Huguenots, a general decline settled upon France. What kind of decline? Well, a spiritual decline because the good guys left, right? Flourishing manufacturing cities fell into decay. Have you seen any cities starting to really go down and go bad? What? Chicago. Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Detroit, New York. I mean, these cities have gone into rapid decay since COVID-19, 84. And so what we have is these flourishing manufacturing cities fell into decay. Fertile districts, which were places they would grow things, returned to their native wilderness. That's not far in our future. Um, no wonder Bill Gates has recently purchased almost a quarter million acres of farmland here in America. You think that's going to be flourishing for the people? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he and Monsanto have a connection. <laughs> intellectual dullness and moral declension succeeded a period of unwanted progress. There was unwanted progress. It was going very well. But when the Huguenots, the good guys, when they left, all the cities started going into decay and the, the intellectual and moral decline followed. Okay. Paris became one vast almshouse. What is an almshouse? Well, if, if you look that up, it's like a place where it's um, welfare state housing, okay? What is it? Beggars. Beggars are there. Homeless are there. People that don't have enough food, they need something to be able to take care of them. That's what happened in the French Revolution. That kind of thing is happening right now in North America, okay? Authoritarianism, totalitarianism, that's what it leads to. Rejection of the Bible as what happened in France and what's going on here in North America. Getting rid of the good guys who claim to be Protestants and bringing in all the Catholics. By the way, if you go and find the religious affiliation of those leaders in America right now, there's a whole huge majority of them that are Catholic. It's incredible. And so watch this. I said that for a reason. Notice, 
Paris became one vast almshouse. And it is estimated that at the breaking out of the revolution, 200,000 paupers claimed charity from the hands of the king. They were on welfare, if you will. A whole big group of people were just taking charity from the king. And that's kind of like the stimulus <laughs> checks were coming. There was the first one was 600 under the Republicans, but the Democrats wanted to look a little better. So they said, we'll give you 2000. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so we, we uh, we're seeing it happen, aren't we? These people are st having to live as paupers receiving stimulus checks from the king. And so here the Jesuits alone. Did you hear what I said? The Jesuits alone flourished in the decaying nation. Did you know it said that? I didn't until it was pointed out to me. The Jesuits alone flourished in the decaying nation and ruled with dreadful tyranny over churches, over churches, over schools, prisons, and galleys. And so what we're seeing in Daniel chapter 6. You're asking what is galleys. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to look that one up. The ships? Prison ships. Okay. We'll have to look. I'm going to put up on the screen maybe a definition of what that word is. But so what we have is Daniel chapter 6 describing what Daniel did not understand in chapter 8. Daniel was told about this system that would come, and it, we call it the abomination of desolation. It would last for 1260 years, and it would be totalitarian in practice, okay? And so Daniel didn't get it. It wasn't told like, this is Medo-Persia, this is Greece, this one's going to rule, and it's going to be ugly. He's like, who, what's that about? Daniel later was given a firsthand experience of what that will look like. There will be a government. There will be leaders. Those leaders will be false. They will bring in a worldwide movement that brings in persecution, false or uh, without religious liberties. And they will claim infallibility with one man at their head who is, in fact, totalitarian. And so you have this experience going on. And, and guess what? That beast of Revelation 13 verses 1 through 10 has an image. And the image of the beast is where your feet are right now in North America. And not only will the Christian movement be making an image to the beast, but they will be connecting with the civil authorities of that nation. The civil authorities, I say, according to my understanding of Bible prophecy, I may be wrong, and I'm sure there's many things that I don't understand, but I am saying that according to Bible prophecy, what it seems like to me is that Daniel chapter 6 will be played out again here in North America. We call it the image of the beast. The civil authorities will be totalitarian generally, and yeah, they'll be using the religious right. But that's their goal, is to use the civil arm to bring an end to Daniel. Now, I do not want to partake of the wrath of the whore that's described in the first, second, and third angels messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. I don't want to. It's, it's not going to be fun to me. But I would much less rather partake of the wine of the wrath of God. And so were I to choose one or the other, I would rather be faithful to God and receive the wrath of the wine of the, the beast, the harlot woman who is drunk with that wine, which is the blood of the saints over the many thousands of years. And so you're going to drink wine. Which one are you going to take? I would rather have the wine of the wrath of the woman comparatively. It's coming. It's going to happen. Christ was foretelling before he was crucified it's going to happen. It's going to be ugly. You guys are going to be really upset. And they didn't even want to ask questions about it. They were like, the disciples were like, well, what did he mean? What did he say? What, what, what's, what's that about? Well, I don't know. Don't ask him because I'm, I'm not sure. And they're like, yeah, Christ is going to rule Rome. No, he's not. Christ is going to be crucified and it's going to be ugly. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and it was ugly. Well, by God's grace, Daniel came out alive and we're thankful for that. But uh, not all of us will. We're going to have to face these searches, like Daniel was searched in his civil 
you know, in, in regard to the kingdom, and he was also searched in regard to his religious life. How do you stand in those regards? Are you faithful? Do we need to make some changes in our lives? Do we need to take God more seriously? I think we're at that time. We're, we don't, if time before us goes as fast as the last year behind us, we don't have a lot of time. The, the last movements, the final movements, will be rapid ones. We've got 30 days, family. <laughs> that 30 days that was talked about in Daniel chapter 6. And so I want to commit myself to God right now, asking that no matter what it is that's in my life that's contrary to his will, I want to get rid of it. And if you're willing to do that, then let's bow together. If you can't bow, raise your hands. God understands, but let's just ask God for his mercy to continue. Holy and Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time where we could be together with you and we could learn from your word. You've told us that we can be, according to 1 Peter 1.23, born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And I'm praying that today, if in fact we have needed to hear this message, to wake us up to what is in our lives that should not be there, then please bear us again. Help us to be born again by your word that was spoken today. If I have misspoken, please clarify that, Lord. If I have misunderstood, help me to understand better, to more fully proclaim the truth about what you've described in the stories of the Bible and the prophecies as well. We don't want to worship the beast in his image. We want to worship you and your image. And so please, Lord, give us the courage that will stand up against the wrath of the wine of her fornication. I pray that uh, we would not fear, rather we would have perfect love that casts out fear and we'll be able to know and understand that our foundation is sure. Give us this faith, Lord, help us to study and find what is true and to hold on to it as though we're holding on to that lifeline that you've sent to us. Thank you for blessing us with this, Lord, this time together. And Please direct our lives. Help us to be faithful in study, studying your word and in prayer. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.